for policy and militarism. Um, and we're looking today at the role of the UK in arming repression, um, in, its, in its role as one of the biggest arms exporters in the world. Um, the arms trade is one that is mediated and supposedly controlled by the UK government. And we are told over and over again that this is a responsible arms trade and one with rigorous and robust controls. Um, even though the UK provides arms to more than 100 countries globally, um, even though when police in Hong Kong or the United States attacked protesters, they were using UK made equipment. Um, even when we heard yesterday about the use of UK weapons during the Arab uprisings and in repression since. Um, but in fact, if you listen to the government, it sounds as if these weapons could even be a positive source of change. Somehow they're securing the UK's influence around the world or allowing it to promote its values. Um, which sound much like some of the claims we may have heard for colonialism too. Um, so next week's going to mark six years since a Saudi Arabian led coalition launched, launched its first bombing attacks on Yemen. And those are attacks that use UK made planes, bombs and missiles. Um, so we're going to hear from Osama about the impact of the conflict in Yemen and the need for accountability and what needs to happen to reduce the suffering of Yemen's people. Um, over this same time, we've also seen continuing attacks on human rights and increased crackdowns under Turkey's leadership, while the UK has been increasing its efforts to strengthen and deepen a defence relationship. Um, and Sheena is going to tell us more about the situation in Turkey and solidarity and resistance. Um, lastly, Anna is going to help us unpick some of those myths and layers of double talk around what the UK government says and what it does. Um, but we're going to start today in Yemen, where Osama is the Director of Media, Communications and Advocacy at Martina for Human Rights, um, and also former Director of Research for Martina. Um, Martina is an independent Yemeni organisation which advocates through human rights, for human rights through documenting violations, providing legal support to victims, lobbying, as well as raising awareness and building capacity. Um, they do amazing work. They were recently awarded the Baldwin Medal of Liberty Award by Human Rights First um, and recently nominated. Um, we're really not we're really honored alongside Kat to have been nominated uh, alongside Kat to have been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, um, a nomination which was specifically intended to draw attention to the situation in Yemen. OK, over to you, Osama. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm very glad uh, to be with you today uh, in this panel. Uh, so uh, after years of armed conflict uh, in Yemen, which started in September 2014, the result today is, is clear. Uh, uh, a country torn uh, apart and the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Uh, the war in Yemen is not a pure civil war, and it doesn't uh, involve only local sides, but there are also uh, regional and international dimensions, in particular uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, backed by uh, the UK, uh, US, and other states on a hand. And on the other hand, uh, um, Iran, which backs the uh, Ansar Allah armed group, or as known as the Houthis. Uh, the responsibility of the worst humanitarian crisis is the responsibility of all warring parties, including states fueling the war with selling and providing uh, arms to the uh, warring parties. Uh, this has been documented uh, by uh, um, uh, the UN group of eminent experts, uh, UN panel of experts, as well as the uh, uh, documentation of uh, human rights organizations. Uh, so, uh, how how to tackle all these issues, including the the arms sales, which uh, uh, where the weapons are used against civilians and uh, uh, against civilian objects like hospitals and uh, and schools? Uh, and from my point of view, uh, is that we need to work toward uh, accountability and and redress. Uh, Yemen's warring parties have shown themselves again and again to be uninterested uh, in pursuing credible accountability or, or redress. 
since 2014, um, human rights uh, organizations uh, and UN entities have documented and published wide range of abuses committed by all parties to the conflict. Uh, and much of information already collected indicates that officials on all sides of the conflict are implicated in a host of uh, potential international crimes, uh, ranging from war crimes to torture uh, to starvation. Um, uh, uh, and why, why, why is this happening since 2014 when uh, Ansarullah uh, and uh, military units loyal to former President Ali Abdullah Saleh uh, and the escalation of the armed conflict started when the uh, Saudi UAE led coalition started the military intervention in March 2015. Uh, since then till now, we have seen uh, these violations and the reason behind this is impunity. Uh, uh, impunity has uh, driven the deterioration of the human rights and humanitarian situation in Yemen. Uh, last year, for example, uh, 2020 was another year of impunity. Uh, it, ended uh, it ended with a, a horrific attack on Aden International Airport on, on December 30, uh, coinciding with the arrival of the new internationally recognized government of, of Yemen to the city. Dozens of civilians were killed uh, or injured in the attack, including uh, some staff members of uh, uh, International uh, Committee of Red Cross, ICRC, as well as journalists. Uh, in addition, we have we are we still have four journalists uh, still detained by uh, by the Houthis, and they are facing uh, death penalty. Uh, and uh, in general, in, in 2020, Muatana has documented more than 1,000 incidents of violations of uh, international humanitarian law and international human rights law. And we need, and we need, as I mentioned before, that the accountability is needed to uh, to stop this. And also, we need to think about uh, uh, accountability and address as the only real uh, factors that will uh, sustain any uh, peace efforts in in the country. Uh, so uh, the international community can and should do more to bridge what the UN group of eminent experts have described as the um, acute accountability gap in Yemen. Um, uh, recently, we have uh, uh, for, like the, the recent developments in the country is the uh, Ansarullah Houthis attacking um, Ma'rib city, uh, which hosts millions of, of civilians and ceasefire in, in Ma'rib and across the country is necessary to avoid uh, more tragic humanitarian and human rights uh, complications. Uh, the clashes in, in Ma'rib city uh, is also threatening the situation in Hudayda, which uh, has the Hudayda port, uh, uh, which, which is the main entry point for humanitarian aid and commercial goods. And uh, therefore, uh, there is a need for uh, uh, not only to stop the, the arms sales, uh, ending the arms sales is one thing that the states can do to stop fueling the armed conflict, but there are uh, other actions and other uh, uh, factors uh, or points that the international community, uh, including the United Kingdom, needs to, 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 to focus on. Uh, first of all, is to call for a ceasefire in, in, in Ma'rib and across the country. Uh, because civilians can't wait anymore, and they can't bear, they can't continue bearing all the implications and the hardship of the uh, the armed conflict. Uh, there is a need to explore the establishment uh, of mechanism to ensure criminal accountability and reparations for Yemen. Uh, there is a need to continue to support the existing mandate of group of eminent experts on Yemen and utilizing uh, 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 their, uh, their findings and endorsing their recommendations, uh, including the ones related to uh, the uh, responsibility of third states, which provide and sell weapons to the uh, warring parties in Yemen. Uh, as a permanent uh, uh, state member, the UK uh, should uh, help and should support the referral of the situation in Yemen 
to the International Criminal Court and expand the list of uh, sanctions to include, to include all sites involved in the uh, armed conflict. Uh, there is also a need to exercise uh, universal jurisdiction as provided by uh, international and domestic law to investigate uh, uh, to investigate and evidence permitting persecute military and civilian officials alleged to have been involved in war crimes in Yemen. Uh, of course, there is a need to, to end the arms sales to Saudi Arabia, to the United Arab Emirates, and the coalition member states for the possibility of being used in violations of international humanitarian law and maybe war crimes. Uh, and it was appalling to see the UK government describing the violations of international humanitarian law as isolated uh, incidents because there, these are not isolated incidents. There is a pattern of targeting civilians and civilian objects by, by, by airstrikes which have used the uh, US and European made weapons and Muatana has released uh, in, in March 2019, Muatana released the report uh, Day of Judgment, which documents the use of US and European made in Yemen by the Saudi UAE led coalition. Um, um, uh, the last two points that the international community uh, can uh, interfere to have positive impact in Yemen is pushing the warring parties uh, uh, and their supporting allies uh, to reach a political agreement without undermining accountability and redress efforts. And uh, finally, I can conclude with this point is that the, uh, the, there is a need to impose uh, targeted sanctions on officials and perpetrators of grave viol uh, violations during the conflict in Yemen, including those from Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, and Iran. Um, uh, so uh, again, uh, the accountability and redress uh, are the key factors if we want to have durable peace in the country and the states and international community should not undermine uh, these factors when there is any coming discussion about uh, peace efforts or, the, uh, uh, or any political uh, uh, process in future. Uh, I will stop here and over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that for that comprehensive overview, both of of what's been happening and what needs to change. Um, we're gonna we're gonna move on to China now, um, who is a steering committee member of Solidarity with the People of Turkey, has been a volunteer at the. DOMA, Turkish and Community Centres for many years, um, and campaigns on issues relating to human rights and democracy in Turkey, um, and often chairs, presents and provides translation support at conferences and public events. And um, we're delighted to hear from you again. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, for inviting me, and thank you, Osama, for that. That was um, uh, really interesting. I, I know, just before I start, that. Um, Riyadh and Turkey have been in talks about Turkey potentially um, supporting um, with mi military and soldiers as well. So it's really and you know anxiety inducing the developments in Yemen. Um, so essentially, I'll I want to say a few words about the human rights situation in Turkey and the Turkish government's politics and how the UK and Europe support. For Turkey's military interventions has really bolstered um, the deteriorating human rights situation on the ground. So I suppose it's fair to say when the AKP first came to power, it, it promised democracy and a peaceful resolution to the Kurdish question in Turkey. Um, at first, there were some kind of hopeful signs that this might be possible with negotiations. Um, continue starting off. However, quickly we saw that growing um, sort of Islamization, authoritarianism began to creep in with nepotism and corruption really exposing itself at every turn. Um, and now I think it's really fair to say that the, a the AKP has returned to the traditional line of rejecting Kurdish identity and rights in Turkey. 
Um, and particularly since the 2013 Gezi Park protests, we've, we've seen um, Turkey take really bold and really fast steps which have dismantled significant foundations of democracy, um, not least undermining the independence of the judiciary through appointing pro-government prosecutors and judges, the closure of almost all opposition media outlets and newspapers, um, large and small, the closure of NGOs, campaign groups, the stripping of immunity from opposition MPs, the arrest and imprisonment of prom prominent democratic leaders, including the HDP um, former leaders who remain in prison, and taking over of opposition local authorities, even in the southeast, predominantly Kurdish areas where um, the AKP just didn't get the votes or the support that it wanted. Um, and in, it's in, in this context that we've seen huge steps backwards in terms of women's rights, workers' rights, and human rights more broadly. So during this time, um, the way that this has been possible is through President Erdogan's steps to consolidate his own power and entrench his leadership um, through really controversial elections, um, which were deemed rigged, a rigged referendum, which granted executive powers to the president, um, enabling um, decrees on a whim, um, really sweeping powers that have harmed the very fabric of democracy in Turkey. And it's these, um, these powers in the politicized judiciary which have been really key tools in criminalizing dissent in Turkey and enabling um, the military exploits that have um, really been sporadic and really frequent in the southeast in, of Turkey in particular, um, which have caused huge amounts of civilian deaths and um, and, and lots of human rights breaches, which have been, to be fair, which have been documented, but everybody who's been involved in the documenting of those has been um, imprisoned or is in exile or, or or somewhere elsewhere. So in the last week, for example, we saw um, the prominent HDP MP Gaga Lolo, who was stripped of his MP status for criticizing um, the government's military interventions. Um, and a further five um, HDP MPs were arrested and charged on um, terrorism charges in the last week also. Um, prosecutors also began legal pr proceedings to close down the HDP in its entirety. And the HDP has been a really important um, democratic force in challenging um, the AKP in Turkey. Um, and huge, there's huge criticism of the treatment of HDP, even by mainstream kind of opposition parties like the C CHB. So um, I just want to flag something. These developments all took place, these developments that have taken place in the last week, all happened a week after Erdogan announced this human rights plan, action plan, uh, where he said, with no hint of irony at all, I'm gonna read this, we will continue to stand by, this, by citizens against all kinds of threats to dignity, beliefs and values. Everyone is equal before the law without any discrimination based on language, religion, race, color, gender, political, voice, uh, political views. Um, and this is, uh, the, it, the irony of this just I, just can't be lost. This is an absolute attempt to hide its own human rights violations. And what's and what's important is not what he says on on television. It's what's happening on the streets. We saw recently Barzich students criminalized and arrested for protesting against the appointment of a rector. Um, strikes are banned. And even la just last night at midnight, um, the president announced that Turkey is withdrawing from the Istanbul Convention. Um, by presidential decree unilaterally, which is one of the very, very important pieces of legislation protecting women in Turkey. So um, pro-government and the uh, media outlets have really been hailing these positive, so-called positive developments by the government, but whilst also um, pushing government lines on the HDP as terrorists, as students being terrorists, as women who protest on the streets as being lesser women, and really being a mouthpiece, mouthpiece for the authoritarianism, um, whilst kind of opposition newspapers face penalties and regular imprisonment. Um, as a result of the work that they're doing. So what is the AKP political strategy? Um, 
Militarization and neo-Ottoman ambitions are, have been prominent since the Gezi protests in 2013 and the coup and state, and a state of emergency in 2016. And we've seen numerous military operations launched, as I mentioned earlier, um, frequently ending in the deaths of civilians and in political failure. Most recently in the GAR, GAR operation, um, you know, a complete mess up of an operation which resulted in the deaths of Turkish soldiers who, um, who until then, actually the PKK or, you know, there, there's word that there were offers to negotiate, which um, Turkey completely rejected, but in, instead just chose overnight to, to bomb. Um, and, and really um, it's this, put, the push for militarization is about regional power, which is why Turkey keeps pushing these military operations, with, even without um, parliamentary approval and military expenditure is going up both in terms of purchase and the development of arms um, really, really, really quickly. And these, and so where, um, what, what this, one of the purposes it serves, not just the financial and economic interest, but also to galvanize nationalism and divide and rule on nationalistic lines. Um, so with, and this is boosted with an alliance with the um, MHP, which is a um, nationalist um, a party in parliament, uh, which is uh, allied with Erdogan in recent, in recent years. So, and indeed Turkey is the only country to regularly undertake military operations with its own, within its own borders. And to date, this has been unchallenged by the UK um, at all. In fact, since, since the time that I've been campaigning with SPOT, um, I have yet to see anything apart from um, Boris's ridiculous poem, which has even been remotely critical of, of Turkey. So, um, so even as early as, so if we look at how the UK government has behaved, even as early as December 2016, the European Parliament voted to suspend talks with Turkey on EU accession. Um, and in the same month, Austrian Parliament suspended its sales of arms to Turkey in response to um, concerns about human rights. And in response, Erdogan threatened to open Turkey's borders and, borders and let migrants into the EU. Um, we don't have time to sort of talk about the ethics of the refugee, um, the refugee situation, but during this time, there were huge protests against Turkey's attacks, both in Turkey and across Europe and in the UK. Um, and it was in this context that the Nationalist Party MHB began working with Erdogan as well to extend Erdogan's parties and start building this one-man regime. Um, human rights violations were evidenced um, in Jizre and other parts of the Kurdish regions which were under military siege. Um, and in January, whilst all this was happening, in January, despite calls from various organizations, including Kat at the time, um, and spot, Theresa May signed an agreement with Turkey for 100 million for BAE systems to support Turkey's development of fighter jets. Um, and they also partner up on, partnered up on a joint venture with Turkish company, I think Neural Holdings, um, to build attack vehicles. And Erdogan's own son or son-in-law was um, had huge interest in those, in those companies. Um, and today, Turkey remains a priority market for the UK, and we can see when we look at those priority markets that the UK has no qualms. This isn't this isn't hypocrisy, even as far as I'm concerned. This is outright um, saying this is where our financial interest lies. Um, war serves our economic interests, and we will continue to do this uh, to do these deals for as long as it serves our interest to do so. Which is why we're so silent on Saudi. And, and other parts of the world. And on the 8th of March, most recently, I mean, we've seen following our exit from the EU um, that on, Turkey was the first to sign a trade deal. Um, most as recently as the 8th of March, Johnson held bilateral talks with Erdogan on furthering this relationship with a focus on defense as a key industry. Um, and, and we've seen that Turkey's prominence in the development of cheap drones um, have rapidly altered the military balance in the region. Um, and this summer, I understand that Azerbaijan also purchased drones from Turkey. And um, instead of condemning the humanitarian issues that this raises um, uh, in terms of the attack on the Armenians, um, the MOD have praised the success successful operation and said they too want a piece of this pie. You know, they want, they want more of this. 
Um, and just finally, um, before I go on too long, um, it's not just the UK, um, which is openly support supportive. The EU more broadly has been much more hypocritical in this space because it's been um, oh, you know, actively criticizing Turkey, but also continuing to trade in the arms in the arms in this. Germany is a very ample example. Germany has been praised for its standoff with Turkey for its attacks on human rights and welcoming an approach to Jan Dündar who, who exposed Turkish Sikh service provision of arms across its borders to um, um, terrorist organizations. But last year we saw that even as it was criticizing Turkey's human rights records, um, Turkey was also Germany's best customer in terms of arms sales. We have over 344, if I'm not, I'm hoping I'm not getting this wrong, but the, the numbers, we have over 344 million euros of arms being sold to Turkey in 2019. Um, and that's significant where for a country that sells about 823 million euros, euros of arms that year. Um, I think Anna might, might know more about this than I do, but I thought that was really um, pushing. So the rise of prominence of Turkey as a major customer for UK arms sales and as a partner in the development of weapons really coincides with this increasing totalitarian authoritarian regime. And it's clear to us that it's no accident that the UK government is not turning a blind eye. And despite calls for even um, the smallest amount of accountability, for what's going on, it, it's been falling on deaf, deaf and blind ears, um, deaf and blind, um, and a deaf and blind government. Um, so, um, and it's in, and it's to this end that really spot has been established. So these attacks on democracy, standing up for fundamental rights, and we recognise that um, fighting against the uh, fighting against attacks on democracy has to, at its heart, be anti-war, to develop a peaceful and democratic solution. To, um, to the issues that, that are happening in Turkey and to deliver the socio-cultural, political and economic rights of Turkey's Kurds um, and wider minorities. And so we've been campaigning um, for many years um, through actively in building bridges between trade unions in Turkey, the women's organizations in Turkey through the Kurdish, through spotlighting and working with the Kurdish and opposition MPs and political groups to really um, empower and give voice to the actual movement on the ground um, and bring those both to, um, to the attention of um, parliament and organizations, human rights organizations across the UK. Um, I agree with everything Osama said on what needs to do, but trade, I think trade deals um, and the you know, targeted sanctions, which really stop the selling of arms and the development of arms and the development of parts that can be used in arms are, are really, really critical first steps to, um, uh, to start talking about these um, human rights breaches and calling to account those governments. Thank you so much for um, that really clear explanation of um, hypocrisy and, and what's going on and, and also moving towards some, some ideas of, of action we can take and ways to move forward. Um, I'm going to ask Anna now to, um, to delve a bit more deeply into what the UK government says and take that apart for us. Thank you so much, Sarah, everyone. Good afternoon. I'd like to take this opportunity to draw together some of the threads of what Osama and China have been telling us about what's been happening in Yemen and in Turkey and offer some reflections on UK arms export policy. So the UK government claims repeatedly, some might say ad nauseum, to have one of the most robust arms export control regimes in the world. A control regime that is based on risk assessment and the prevention of human rights and international humanitarian law violations. However, we continuously and repeatedly see controversies and the agreeing of deals and the granting of licenses that contravene those criteria as has been explained to us, some of the examples given to us by Osama and by Chinar. 
And so the question that leaves me with is how come? How come when we have such a policy that on paper is very clear, we have these repeated controversies? And what are we to make of these controversy about the meaning of UK arms export policy and the character of UK foreign policy? So in this short talk, I'm going to talk a bit about how it is that we've ended up in this situation and then offer two reflections on, on what to make of it in terms of drivers and responses. And this is based um, quite a lot on the research that I've been doing over the past five or six years into arms exports to the Saudi-led coalition and their involvement in the war in Yemen. But I think the lessons are generalizable. The war in Yemen is merely the worst case um, on, on, a, on a rather long list of, of terrible cases. So how is it that the government continues to issue licenses that seem to fly in the face of its publicly stated policy? What we've seen from the war in Yemen is the systematic refusal to know, failure to know about international humanitarian law violations. The Ministry of Defense is only able to track a very small percentage of airstrikes conducted by the Saudi-led coalition and have admitted that they could identify a military target in only about a third of cases. And up until Campaign Against Arms Trade took them to court, the government was not assessing whether there was a pattern to any past violations. And when Campaign Against Arms Trade won their legal case against the government, the Court of Appeal forced the government to go back and retake those decisions to assess whether there was a past pattern. And the government uh, did its review and as, as Osama pointed out to us, came up with the conclusion that these violations were only isolated incidents. And therefore any past, uh, past previous airstrikes were not evidence of the future risks posed by arms export licenses. So the government seems to be claiming that as long as it can say that it does not know that there have definitely been violations of international humanitarian law, then there is no risk or no clear risk that there might be. But just to give you the precise wording of the government's policy, it's that it will not issue arms export licenses where there is a clear risk that they might be used in a serious violation of international humanitarian law. So it's based on risk prevention, which is supposed to pre prevent catastrophic harm. And these claims to not know about patterns of violations in places like Yemen are backed up when the controversy becomes too much. So there have been incidents that have become too public, too controversial for the government, both the UK government and the Saudi government to ignore. And so when those cases have become, um, have, have threatened to become too controversial, the government, both the UK and the Saudi governments claim that any mistakes were unintentional. And then we see a series of practices of reputation management, also known as whitewashing, um, to exonerate the Saudi military forces from the supposed mistakes that they may have made, which is akin to the, um, the type of argument that we often see about a few bad apples, that there is no systematic problem here, it is only isolated incidents. And I think in the case of the war in Yemen, that claim is simply unsustainable. The UK government claims to have a close relationship with the Saudi government and claims to be able to exercise leverage, but we've seen that the UK has not been able to rein in the behavior of the Saudi-led coalition in the war in Yemen. So what we see as an end result in terms of UK arms export policy is that instead of being preventive, risk assessment actually ends up facilitating harm because arms exports to the Saudi coalition have um, increased massively over the duration of the war in Yemen. So with that snapshot of UK policy, what are we to make of it? How are we to understand it? I want to say 
a couple of things, one about drivers and one about responses. So in terms of drivers of policy, it's, it's often tempting for us as people who are politically interested uh, in UK arms export, arms export policy to frame it as um, a problem of the influence that the arms industry has on government. But I want to argue that it's only partly about corporate profit. Don't get me wrong, it is partly about corporate profit. BAE Systems has made over 15 billion pounds in revenue since the war in Yemen began. But the UK arms relationship with Saudi Arabia is a government to government agreement in which the state and arms companies work together. BAE Systems is the prime contract, what's called a prime contractor. It's, it works on behalf of the Ministry of Defence to fulfil this agreement. And one key effect of this relationship is mutual deniability. So the government can refuse to release information about BAE Systems on the grounds of commercial confidentiality. And when BAE Systems has questions about its activities, it says it operates within the bounds of the law and of UK policy. And we see these patterns in operation even when we look at the UK's arms relationships with other states where the arms relationships are not necessarily agreed under government to government deals. So in my view, even if arms companies were owned by the state, even if they were nationalized, they would still have a tap on the state's defense budget unless the state decided to turn that tap off. So I think we need to think beyond the narrow idea of government simply being at the service of individual companies and think more about the way in which arms exports are part of a wider system in which the UK state tries to maintain a strategic role in parts of the world such as the Middle East, both in terms of British military and economic power and maintaining relations um, with Gulf regimes and other regimes that it wants to um, maintain good relations with. If you're interested in this topic, David Wearing has a fabulous book called Anglo Arabia that sets out a lot of this in more detail. So that's a word about some of the drivers. I think we need to think about what the government is doing and what the state is doing as much as what the arms companies are doing and pay attention to the ways in which those, um, those interests in, in, inter, interlink. And so thinking then in terms of responses. One of the things that I'm particularly interested in is the character of the justifications that the UK government offers for its arms exports. And it's always in terms of values, liberal values around tolerance, around support for human rights, support for the rule of law, and so on. And we've heard the term hypocrisy mentioned a couple of times in this panel already. And I think we need to move beyond simple accusations of hypocrisy, because I think the hypocrisy is actually part of the point. Liberal states, those that claim to be interested in and supportive of human rights, they offer justifications in terms of human rights and in terms of support for humanitarian law that are actually part of the package of facilitating war crimes. So I think we need to connect up arms exports to overseas states, to British domestic military procurement, to the provisioning of the UK military and the wars that the UK is involved in fighting in. So that this is not simply a problem of what foreign states over there are doing in their wars or in their repression, but what are we doing with our weapons in our wars, in our repression? So connecting up military power to police power. And I think the CAT conference is a really, really good example of how we might start making those connections. And I think the final point that I'll end on is to pick up what Osama said about the importance of accountability, redress and reparations. I think for those of us who are based in the UK, who are UK taxpayers or who are UK citizens who are, or who are 
the political community on behalf of whom the government claims to speak. I think we, rather than thinking in terms of sympathy or aid, I think we need to think in terms of solidarity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. That's, um, that's a good call to end on after. Um, after that analysis, um, I would like to just offer the rest of the opportunity, uh, rest of the panel, um, to an opportunity to pick up on or respond to anything you've heard. Um, and in the meantime, also to encourage everyone with us today to, to start putting your questions in. Um, is, is there anything you'd like to respond to? I suppose I, spoke, I suppose I could just say something really quickly. I think um, what Anna um, has said is, is so, so important about looking beyond um, looking beyond just what, you know, the government is doing or some of that messaging and really thinking in terms of um, in terms of our actions. I think often this kind of sympathy and aid um, kind of element of war takes such a huge domin dominance in um, public responses to um, humanitarian um, and, and actually uh, humanitarian crises is kind of uh, is this kind of terminology which um, makes accountability ambiguous doesn't it it's, it makes it look like nobody's really to blame but there's this awful war going on there let's send some money and let's feel sorry for these people and um, let's just be kind and this will all be over and I think the term solidarity is such a um, such an important, um, such an Im important um, tool, I suppose. It's not just a term, isn't it? It's, it's a tool. And the issue for us as campaigners and as organizations who are committed to creating some sort of change in this space and really calling to account both our own and, um, and, and other governments and organizations who are complicit in this is is to really think about how we bring to life that solidarity. What does that solidarity look like? Um, you know, who do, who are we standing in solidarity with, and whose voices are we amplifying in that? Um, and I think that's you know there are lots of examples um, that we can draw up, but that's something that I think we all need to think very carefully about. Um, one thing I wanted to pick up on is um, the role of arms companies um, and and accountability. You've all you've all talked about accountability, um, and and Anna's given us a good explanation in terms of um, you know, the tendency for us just to to, to blame arms companies um, and their influence. Um, so I'm thinking we've talked about them a lot. I'm thinking about the UK's BA systems. Um, which, as we've said, is, is the prime contractor on the big arms deals, multi-billion arms deals with Saudi Arabia and its bees, typhoons and tornadoes in the skies over Yemen, and its staff on the ground helping keep those planes. The 100 million deal that the UK government again helped broker for BAE to support the development of fighter jets. Um, now, Anna mentioned that when these companies are questioned about their supply and use of weapons, they argue we're just operating within the law. The responsibility sits with the government. We're just doing a job and following the rules and regulations. Um, and it's up to the government to tell us to stop. Having, having talked all about accountability, um, uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on this response and approach and, and if and how we should be holding them to account? I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but I'm wondering if Asana would be able to talk to us a little bit more about the ICC, the International Criminal Court case, is one way to take that forward. Yes, sure. Uh, the uh, uh, end of last year, um, um, different uh, group of, uh, of organizations, including um, Moatana, CAT, the, uh, the European Center for uh, 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 Constitutional and uh, Human Rights and other organizations have 
um, submitted a communication to the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to investigate the, uh, the, the European responsibility of uh, the officials and the, uh, the executives of, of arms, uh, uh, arms uh, uh, industry, uh, uh, depending on uh, uh, incidents that were documented by Muatana uh, uh, from, from the field. Uh, and it's, it's, the, it's necessary uh, and also, we believe that, uh, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, that the responsibility of, of the violations committed in the war is not only the responsibility of the warring parties only, but also the responsibility of their allies, uh, legally and ethically even. Uh, the, uh, 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 the, the states is not only, uh, are not only required to stop the armed cells. This is one thing that they can do. Uh, but uh, the situation in Yemen, uh, uh, since they, they have been involved in a way or another, the situation in Yemen requires much more than ending the armed cells. It requires a pushing toward political agreement. It requires pushing toward accountability to prevent uh, any further human rights uh, violations in the country. Um, and uh, as, uh, uh, as we, we, we all know that the, the change in the administration in the United States, for example, uh, it's good to, to, to hear that the uh, Biden administration uh, announcing the end of armed cells, even though it's still unclear how and what exactly uh, that means, but uh, this is good, but not enough. Uh, there's much more required from the United States uh, to, uh, to have or to play a positive role in, uh, in Yemen, uh, including pushing for a political uh, uh, a political agreement, as well as pushing for uh, accountability to uh, to stop the uh, or to break the cycle of violence in the country. Sarah, may I add something? Please do. Um, or join in. Just to to follow up on what Osama was saying, I think I think it's good to think in terms of pursuing a variety of routes to chase down this mutual deniability between the government and companies. So if we look around the world, there are a variety of actions that are being taken against both governments and companies that, that are trying to close down those gaps that are being exploited by states and by companies. So in the UK, we've seen the, the court case that CAT brought against the government Nationally, we have this coalition of organizations, including Moatana um, and CAT, that are taking a complaint to the International Criminal Court that is directed at um, both the senior executives of arms companies and the senior officials in states who might have been helping them in terms of their criminal potential criminal responsibility for war crimes in Yemen. And then around the world, we, we see um, the dockers in Italy and France who were trying to stop the ships that are moving the parts that are going from Europe um, to Saudi Arabia. Dockers trying to stop the, the shipments being allowed to, to come into their countries to be, to be transferred. We've got their sort of throwing grit in the wheels, if you like, of this relationship between companies and government. So I think there are a variety of mechanisms that people can use, either legal or political, writing to your MP, um, or direct action in terms of um, intervening in the supply chain to, to stop that relationship running as smoothly as it would like. Okay, we've got some great questions coming in in the, in the Q&A, and some of that sort of follows in in terms of these places for intervention. Um, one in terms of how the finance industry as a whole supports the arms trade. Um, but also related questions, I think, in terms of what percentage, like how much, how important this is as part of, of the UK economy and as a percentage of UK manufacturing, you know, can we, can we survive without the arms trade? Is anyone feeling able to take any of those on? Thanks. 
I can make an initial intervention. Um, so you can, I think Sam has put in the uh, written responses that actually arms exports are really only a very small part of the UK economy. Um, he said that they account for 0.49% of GDP, only 1.7% of total exports and 3.2% of manufacturing exports. So I think what interests me about these arguments about the role of the arms trade in the economy is how, how we've got to the position where arms exports have a significance in the public consciousness far above and beyond their actual economic significance. And I find that interesting for a couple of reasons. One is because the situation that we have now where um, we where the government and the industry are able to make these claims that, well, if we want to support British manufacturing, if we want to support skilled jobs in this country, if we want to support science, technology and engineering, we have to support the arms industry. That is itself a result of political choices that have been made over decades to run down other elements of British manufacturing. These were not accidents. These were political choices made to destroy other parts of the economy and support the, 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 this one um, and also the turn to finance and so on. And then the other thing I'd say is that um, I think, so I think the, the, the arguments about, the economic arguments about arms exports ha have much more of an ideological function than, than any um, sort of practical function in terms of actual discussions we might want to have about how the economy is organized. And I think that links to the question about the role of the, the, the sort of finance industry and the treasury and, and banks, because on the one hand, there's a very uh, important role of things like export credits, which is the, the sort of the state backing up the arms industry and facilitating it, making its um, deals and, and making its profits off the back of research and development that is funded significantly by the Ministry of Defense using our taxpayers' money for companies to then make profit that is appropriated privately. So we have taxpayer funded uh, research to make uh, profits for companies where the, the shareholders um, then, then make the money. And one of the things that, that I'm quite interested in the UK case is what it would take for other segments of the economy to start getting annoyed at the undue levels of support that are provided to the arms industry. So if I was somebody who ran a business making green technologies, for example, I'd be quite annoyed uh, about the levels of state support that go to the arms industry. And I would wonder why it was that the state was not subsidizing um, my industry with anything like the kind of ideological fervor that it is the arms industry. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to add anything on that? Okay, we'll go. Oh. Sorry, I suppose there's only just one one other thing at the, you know, the question about um, the finance industry and the wider kind of um, industries and other industries involvement um, and influence in the arms trade. And I think one of the things that really strikes me is that often um, often, uh, you know, BAE systems are a huge obviously the arms, uh, arms company, but there are also numerous companies that develop and manufacture parts which, which go into the final um, uh, fighter jets or whatever military equipment is, is, being, is being pulled together. And we saw recently, for example, with the drones in Turkey, that Garmin, Garmin parts were found in, um, in the drones that were used in Azerbaijan, for example, um, and we know that you know regular consumer um, manufacturers um, can also sometimes inadvertently or on purpose, and that's you know it's all to me it's all very ambiguous. Make some mirrors about whether or not they knew that this was where their uh, their technology and their equipment was ending up. But those those are also really interesting avenues to kind of keep an eye on in terms of call into account arms companies. Um, and they also show how inherently 
um, entrenched in the system, um, the development of, you know, the use of um, arms and technology um, that supports the development of weapons is in our economy. And that makes it very difficult in terms of calling to account, but it also presents an opportunity. Um, next up in the in the Q and A, we have um, a question on sanctions and concerned how um, governments like the UK have often used sanctions uh, um, against states they don't like as a as a political tool. Um, so some concerns about the idea of how sanctions could be used um, uh, in that way again, um, whether Iran, you know, Iran is already targeted with sanctions. Um, is there a more helpful way of, of dealing with states? Our governments are happy to sanction for political reasons is the, is the question. Um, and I think, it, I think it relates to some of the things you were talking about, Summer, in terms of positive actions that the U, UK government could be taking. Um, I also wonder how much hope you have for them to take these actions alongside their role um, as a supplier of weapons. Um, for for any any sanctions that the states uh, might do for for those who are involved in human rights violations, first of all, they need to be to have the same standards for all warring parties. Uh, once it only targets uh, one side and ignoring the other side, uh, then it's not uh, it's not a form of accountability. Uh, but it might stop or. Uh, send the message to those who are involved uh, in human rights violations to stop. Uh, but of course, when, 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 when I mentioned the, the, the sanctions, I'm particularly talking about uh, individuals who are involved or responsible for human rights violations. And this needs to include all warring parties. Uh, it's, it's, I, I completely agree that there are concerns about the, the use of sanctions politically uh, in a way that might, might affect the, uh, the, 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 the population and uh, might have massive impact on, on the people. So this is to, to clarify, I'm, when I'm talking about the targeted sanctions uh, only for, for, for those who are uh, individuals involved in human rights violations. Thank you very much. We also have um, an aspiring journalist wanting to know about how useful freedom of information requests can be both to gain information and put pressure on government and private institutions and if reforms are needed. I'm looking at you, Anna. Yes. I think you're, I think you're gearing you. up. <laughs> I think that's a really useful question. Um, and I would say that freedom of information is a really useful tool but one not without its problems it's um, a tool that I've used myself in my and the dynamics of the freedom of information process are themselves really interesting and part of the pol political dynamics around how um, information is managed and how um, transparency is managed in the UK so from my experience I have noted a couple of things in relation to how FOI requests are treated. One is the um, one is the use of delay tactics. So I put in a freedom of information request that took almost two years um, to get answered because at every point at which the government was due to answer my question, they said that they needed more time which is not the same as saying, we're not going to answer your question, but saying, oh, I'm sorry, I just need more time, is a very handy way of not answering the question. And in the end, I had to appeal to the information commissioner who found in my favor and compelled uh, the foreign office to release the information that they, um, that they had said that they held. So thinking politically about um, about transparency. So the government is not willing to say we are keeping, well, I'll come back to this. They were not willing to say this is a secret and we're not going to tell you, but they were saying, oh, we don't know if we can. 
Um, so that is part of the political repertoire around transparency. And then there are efforts to keep things secret by using um, the provisions around, um, around um, national security and around confidentiality. And again, these are, uh, if you challenge them, the information commissioner can often find in your favor because the information commissioner, which has, um, is supposed to have an interest in, in tr transparency and people being able to, to see the information that government holds will often take a different view to the government. And one of the things that I find interesting about freedom of information is this, uh, the balancing act that government um, tries to engage in, which says that where there is a public interest test that has to be applied, that actually, while well, there is an interest in the public knowing this, but there's a greater interest in us keeping it secret because it would compromise operational um, abilities or, or, or so on. Rest on, those, those decisions rest on a particular understanding of what security means, whose security and whose interests are we interested in supporting and facilitating here. And so if anybody is making freedom of information requests, I would say be persistent, keep a spreadsheet, know when you made the request, note down when the government is due to reply, chase them if they don't reply by that date, go to the information commissioner if you think they're trying to delay, challenge any refusal by, by articulating why it is you think that the public body's decision is wrong. And you can sometimes win. Um, so it's not a perfect tool because there are some exclusions that are total um, and there are, are ways in which the information commissioner will not necessarily find in your favor. Um, but I think it is a very useful tool. And the other thing, um, finally, that I would say about it is think about what use you're going to then make of that information. So I was able to um, uh, get that freedom of information request into the public. I mean, once it's been released, it is public, but it's but no one cares if no one knows where it is. And so I managed to get that published in a story that ran in The Guardian that was about decisions that Boris Johnson had made when he was foreign secretary about the granting of arms export licenses. So you then need, to, it's one thing to, to have the information, but then what are you going to do with it? So it's about building connections um, with, with journalists. And I think for people who are, who are interested in this, but don't feel very confident, um, write to your local newspaper, find the journalist who writes about stories like this. I, I live in Brighton. Uh, we've had some coverage of of the Edo factory in Brighton. And there is a journalist who I now, you know, I, I know their name, I've got their email address. Start building those connections. It's, it can be a bit scary if you've not done it before, um, but, and, and you won't always get it right first time, but have a go, make those connections and see if you can start building those relations. And feel free to draw on the resources of CAT's outreach and research teams to help you along the way, if you would like. Um, we've had, uh, a question coming in in terms of the, the humanitarian situation in Yemen. Um, as many people will know, the UK government recently announced a massive cut to UK aid to Yemen, just as um, just as warnings of a famine were were being discussed. Um, and Anna, it also specifically relates to your your recent evidence to Parliament um, when you talked about the, the political use of aid. Um, so the question, do you think that the UK government's recent cuts will serve to significantly enhance the regional interests of Saudi Arabia in rebuilding Yemen on their terms um, and any more resources that people should look at to understand a bit more about the situation? Um, Samuel, do you have something to say on that to start us off? Yes, uh, I mean, uh, Yemen is in the need of, of aid, particularly these days with, with, with COVID-19 pandemic, etc. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a, a, a very important element at the point, uh, but it's not the, uh, uh, Yemen should not only uh, look through the lens of the humanitarian aid only, uh, even though it's important for now, uh, but, working on, on, on the long-term uh, 
uh, plans or strategies is what will go is is what we uh, is what will help the country to to be uh, well established. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, I mean the um, the the humanitarian situation is uh, is very deteriorating, particularly with the cuts of salaries, uh, with the, uh, uh, the 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 issue of, or the collapse of the economy and uh, the the local currency. Uh, and any uh, uh, cuts for for aids uh, from from my point of view at the moment is going to to affect uh, the humanitarian operations uh, uh, on the ground uh, and uh, this is uh, one of the responsibilities I believe one of the responsibilities of of uh, the states that are involved uh, in the uh, armed conflict is to help in building rather than destroying through the arms cells. Anna, did you want to add something? Um, yeah, I can, and I can add a follow up. Um, I think one of the things that's very interesting and under remarked on about the war in Yemen is that um, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates have not only been the leading forces of destruction in Yemen, but they have also been the largest humanitarian and de developmental aid donors. Um, and that's something that's been paralleled in the UK where uh, until, I mean, until the recent decision about, about development spending, the UK would routinely uh, emphasize its levels of bilateral aid to Yemen and talk about attending to the humanitarian crisis as if it was nothing to do with the war that the UK is materially supporting that has caused the humanitarian crisis. Um, so I think that's why we need to think much more about uh, the political uses of humanitarian and development aid and the ways in which um, the destruction of war is combined with and complemented by the reconstruction that is facilitated through humanitarian and development aid. And one of the people whose work I've drawn on most um, about this is a scholar who's based at SOAS at the University of London. Her name is Rafif Ziada. Um, I can get the references to her work to, to, to Kat and they can maybe share them more widely. There's also a publication called MERIP, the Middle, Middle East Report, um, who um, a, a couple of years ago had um, a whole special issue on the war in Yemen, looking at the ways in which um, the country is both being destroyed, but also uh, rebuilt in the interests of, of Gulf capital. The question about the significance of um, the UK's recent announcement about cuts to levels of aid is, is, is very interesting. And, I'm, and to be honest, I'm not entirely sure what I think the significance of it is yet. I think we need to think about who the audience is for that claim. And I think in the context of the revival of a very uh, parochial nationalism in the UK and this idea that Tories are going to make Britain great through exports and so on, um, I think that it, it makes, it, it's intended primarily for a domestic audience. Um, but I, I, I don't know, I'd be interested to know what the conversations were between, um, between the UK and Saudi Arabia about um, what their combined vision is for the future of Yemen and how that uh, plays into um, sort of the, the decisions that they are making about the actions they want to take in relation to Yemen. Um, and now, now one of the most important questions, I think, um, in terms of things a lot of you said, um, solidarity and how do we how do we bring that to life? Um, I can start. I feel like Anna's had her fair share of of questions, which is, which has um, saved me because I couldn't have answered a number of those. Um, on solidarity, I think one of the things that's often missing in the conversations we have here um, is 
what's actually happening on the ground by the people of Yemen and by the people of Turkey? What are they doing to resist? Um, how are they organizing? Um, who are the major players on the ground who we need to um, actually, um, su actually support proactively? Um, and for, for me, I think solidarity, it's really important. All the stuff we're, we're gonna do here is really important. The FOIs, um, the, cam the campaigning, calling to account um, the companies, um, everything, all of that's significant. But also I think often one, one of the things that happens is that those authentic voices on the ground get lost. And I think the biggest, one of the uh, most urgent actions we need is to give voice to the movement on the ground against um, against the war. And that's some of the stuff that, um, for example, um, with Yemen, not so likely, but in the in the past, for example, we've sent delegations, journalists, others, I'm sure with Yemen, it's a lot, a lot more complicated, but, you know, um, pre COVID, we used to send delegations to go and see what's on the ground, um, where there were trials of journalists or other um, opposition groups or organizations, we monitored those um to and when and we've heard back from um activists and anti-war organizations and um women's groups and journalists in turkey that monitoring physical monitoring of trials in turkey um have have impacted positively on the outcomes in terms of addressing some of the challenges around the rule of law um i think the the other thing is you know in in conversations like like these, you know, really uh, hearing directly from um, whoever. So, for example, in Turkey, one of the most um, proactive, both anti-war and otherwise, um, movements is the women's movement, uh, who've been really, really powerful in calling to account the government, um, standing up against um, military operations. Um, uh, standing up for academics. So, you know, for, we've made it a priority, for example, to support and work with women's groups in Turkey and connect them with um, women's organizations, human rights organizations in the UK. We've connected, Academics of Peace have done lots of work against, um, against war. We've connected um, um, Academics of Peace with ATIMS uh, and ATIMS, which is like a, um, uh, teachers union with NUT and NEU who are also on our steering group to to enable these organized bodies to work together to call to account both the government in Turkey but also um, raise awareness and call to account our government and companies in the UK so I think those kind of um, practical actions which which mean that we aren't just speaking on behalf of um, of the people of those countries um, is really important Um, Anna, you also spoke about solidarity, but I don't know if you've got more to add here. Thank you, Sarah. I think uh, I would echo what Chinna has said, and I think um, there are a couple of ways in which people can take action. One is um, through engaging Parliament, um, because um, my view is, say what you like about the failings of Parliament. I think if you believe in parliamentary democracy, we have to try and support uh, and insist on the importance of parliamentary accountability. So I think identifying who your MP is, whether they are involved in any of the committees that are um, of relevance to, to arms exports, be it the committees on arms export control or the development of foreign affairs or defence committees, um, writing to them and, and sort of bolstering their hand, providing them with evidence and making demands on them as your representative, I think is really important. Um, I think also um, direct action in the form of um, supporting protests in an environment where that's becoming increasingly difficult. Um, I would say join a trade union. Um, I think be, you know, the more we can get people through their workplace being parts of the movements for divestment, demilitarization, defense diversification, 
and it can happen in ways that you might not think were obvious. So I'm an academic, I'm a university worker, I have a pension with uh, USS, um, trying to take action with my pension scheme to not invest my pension in arms companies. Now, you know, we, I mean, the USS pension is itself um, subject to, to, to all sorts of um, issues at the moment, but it turns out that there's only part of my pension that I can ask not to be invested in arms companies. Fine, well, I will ask for that to be the case, but then being part of a movement to try and press the pension company to take action more widely. Uh, if anybody in the audience is a scientist or an engineer, groups like Scientists for Global Responsibility are an excellent resource. And I think we have, we have an interesting situation in the UK where even though we have a, uh, a long and, and proud and active trade union uh, history that has been quite heavily politically circumscribed, I think the position of arms workers um, within the unions are, are something of a tricky issue for us as a country because trade unions remits are to protect jobs. And so those who are representing arms workers um, want, they want, you know, they want more resources from the state. They want those protections for their workers, but there are voices within the trade unions that represent the arms industry who are asking the question of, well, what are our jobs for? What are our skills being used for? What else might we be making? And so those calls for defence diversification, um, well, they are there and they just need amplifying. And then I think it's a case of making connections. Um, so what to echo what Gina said about not um, speaking for people, but it, it's not that we need to speak for people, it's we, allow, we need to stop other people muffling their voices. So there are lots of uh, Yemeni, uh, and just in terms of the research that I've been doing on, on the war in Yemen, there are lots of Yemeni activists and commentators and women's organizations and human rights organizations who are active on social media, sometimes tweeting in Arabic, but often also tweeting in English. Um, find out if you have a local solidarity group or if you have a, a Yemeni or a Turkish or whatever community in your, on, in your city. Um, hear them speak in their own terms about how they understand um, the issues. I think that that's, that would be a really good place to start. Um, I hope there are some other places on the um, on the programme here this weekend where you'll have the chance to, to do that and make some of those, those connections as well. Um, thank you so much to all our panellists. I'm going to give you an opportunity to make any, any last points. Um, I'm in I'm in the role of having to to push us towards an end because I'm very under very strict instructions that we have to finish on on time today so that our wonderful team can have their lunch break. Um, so if there's any final thoughts, I've been asked a question um, uh, that I'm that I'm not sure I can fully answer the question about main women's groups active in the ground in Yemen. I can't really talk about Yemen, but in Turkey there are numerous. Or you know, there there are there's Marjata, there are there um, there's MEP. Most of the political parties have women's arms, which are very very active. Um, there are these women's parliaments, um, and there are women's um, community organisations um, across the country, which have been very very active in organising international women's day um, demonstrations and protests across the country um, there's also i think notably jinha which is um, um which is a women's um, news agency which has been very very important um, for raising the voices of um, kurdish women in particular in the kurdish regions that's all for me thank you and also thank you for having me well 